for portraiture, I suppose it's always a problem with portraiture or portrait galleries as such, is that is that the images are always done with the full agreement of the subject, or invariably with the full agreement of the subject, unless they're dead. George III actually became a cartoon character, and he's probably the first monarch to do so, and it was largely as a result of James Gilray's efforts. He was the greatest caricaturist ever. He defined George IV, William Pitt, Charles James Fox, George III. He defined them in caricature. This is an official portrait of George III, probably a young George III, as he would like to have been remembered, as he probably was remembered. The thing about caricature is, it, of course, it gives the other side of the coin. It gives the public image of the various royal characters as they would have been seen and understood by the public, but not actually as they would have wished to be seen. What is my motivation to take the piss out of the monarchy? My motivation is, I suppose, a kind of a complete resentment of the, the institution, the fact that it's there, the fact that it's sitting there amplifying the class system. They're not just a joke. You know, they do hold real power and they are a worthy target and they are an incredibly expensive and I think quite pernicious institution. Here, come and have a look at this lot. <laughs> I've just uncovered a case of royal crap. That's Charles and Camilla when the, uh, the news of their affair came public and uh, that's, a sort of, that's based on a paparazzi picture of the two of them coming out of the house. That's Charles the playboy. Can the Archbishop of Canterbury marry somebody who's been divorced or will he die? Will he have to use tongs? You know, this is... <laughs> <laughs> That's Di storming the palace. It's based on an old um, Steinlein, wonderful old uh, Steinlein, lefty anarchist, 19th century French graphic artist. It's the same old movie going round and round, isn't it? Every few years you have a big set piece royal wedding. So much time and effort is devoted to it. This is the balcony at, um, at, at Buckingham Palace. I was walking past it today, actually, coming up to the portrait gallery. It makes you realise that the whole place is like a front door for British imperialism and has been since obviously the Victorian era. And now at the moment they're building all the press points to view the crowds at the time of the wedding, which they presume are going to turn up. They come out on the balcony and they wave. So what else can they do? It's, it's, it's an invidious position if you think about it. You, you've got no choice. They're, they're born to it. They have to do it. And they're extremely wealthy and you know they don't do too badly. People defer to them all the time. They get all kinds of um, perks. But it's a bit of an empty life, really, when all you can do is wave and open buildings. They're there to be looked at. They're a, they're a sort of living spectacle. What kind of life is that? What kind of job is that? Why does Kate want to get involved with this crew? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and I think she ought to be very careful with them, because they're a, they're a pretty merciless bunch, the royals. They might not chop her head off, but they, they do everything but, as, as happened to Di, who got ostracised. It's all about presentation, it's all about show. It's all about presenting an image of a happy family, which of course they're not. These contradictions are why they're so fascinating and why it's an endless source of joy to take the piss out of them. <laughs>